ahead and start with our presentation, how to use laser therapy creatively. My favorite thing to say about laser therapy is that next to a pair of human hands, it is one of the most creative healing tools that you can get your hands on. It is just unlimited to the potential of, of laser therapy in terms of uh, what you want to do. What inspired me to make these classes happen is actually I got angry. And I got angry because I saw a really stupid comment by a chiropractor on a, on a laser website. And it, it made me realize, oh my God, people don't understand the basics of laser therapy. And if they don't get that down, they're gonna totally miss the potential. And the, the guy's comment was, well, this isn't brain surgery. <coughs> Everybody knows all you have to do is point and shoot. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you something. If you get a laser in your hands and all you do is point and shoot, you're still going to be better than 50% of the other clinicians out there working their little tails off. Okay, point and shoot is fine. But, my goodness, you're missing a huge spectrum of things that you can be doing and thinking about in ways that you can save your body from stress and also you can watch miracles happen in your practice. It, this stuff has made me have to really expand my way of thinking about how the body heals because it happens so fast with the laser, it just shocks you. Um, and I, I'll give you that history. I have a patient that you will be meeting tomorrow, and he is going to, uh, his name is Jason. Jason is a traumatic brain injury patient, okay? 10 years, he's been in a wheelchair, uh, tetraplegic, his hand was all locked up, his legs were all, you know, the scissors crossing of the paralysis. It was my experience with Jason that made me realize how important it was to do laser therapy for everybody, okay? Because what I did with Jason is I got his arm unfolding, I got his hand opened up, and I got his legs unfolded, I got the ankle so that I could adjust it, I got the other leg open and, and moving, and these were joints that everybody thought were fused. And I did that, how long do you think it took me to do that? Give me a guess, now this is a fully pro paralyzed patient. A couple weeks to a month. I did that in one session. It happened in my hands, and I was so freaked out when I saw his arms and hands unfolding that I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. His family members stay in the room usually with him. It, they couldn't talk about it for two weeks. They, they simply couldn't even discuss it because what they had seen was almost uncomprehensible. So this really is going to shift our paradigm in terms of what is possible. You know, innate, when we talk about, as chiropractors, when we talk about innate, and we talk about accessing the nervous system, and that we expect to see instant healing, and we do that sometimes with chiropractic, but with laser therapy, you're gonna see it consistently. And what you have to do is, is stop limiting yourself, because the body is unlimited potential in healing. I'm gonna show you why laser therapy works, okay? Did that stay with them? Uh, it stayed with him, and then gradually he pulled up, and now he came back out. We got him moving like this, but I didn't realize what I was seeing. I didn't understand how I had done it. It was really one of those intuitive things. It, what inspired that was that his family came to me, and they said, we want to be able to get his shoes on better. We want him to be able to stand, and the doctors are telling us the only thing they can do is, are you ready for this inspiration? Mm -hmm. Sever the tendons. And I said, I am not going to let that happen. Just wait. And I was determined to find something. I grabbed a homeopathic, put it in his hand, and I started just going for what my intuition said, and he opened up. Now I understand what I did. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that <laughs> now I understand what I did in those moments, and I'm going to be able to share it with you, and I'm going to be able to demonstrate it with you, and wait do you see Jason now. Jason is now taking that paralyzed leg, and he's bending it on his own. It's pretty cool. I spoke with his personal uh, PT, who's a very creative uh, physical therapist and has been doing water therapy with me. She said, you know, he's, uh, he's talking about being cold. His autonomic system's kicking in. He's never talked about being cold before. And his trunk, he can do more things with his, his trunk flexion, and you know, it's just phenomenal to watch Jason recuperate. So we're going to be talking about research, and I hope you might consider joining us in this uh, research for stroke and paralysis and TBI patients. I have a, a very, very personal interest 
in um, helping patients with stroke and, and traumatic brain injuries. I've recuperated from my own traumatic brain injury back when nobody understood what a mild concussion could do, and that's how I became a craniosacral therapist. And I've watched my mother go through uh, trying to rehab from stroke with all the things that I look at now and know they're so limited, and there's so much more we can do with stroke. We had, Tasha was in the room, we had a patient, we had uh, three strokes come in, dismissed from the hospital to us. And this guy was a goner, I'm telling you, he wasn't even aware of what was going on in the room. There's no way he was going to be able to move, I mean, he had a lot of assistance getting on the table. In one session, he started to open up his hand, he looked up, he was blinking, trying to watch what was going on, and he was really starting to come out of it. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about some of those things, but let's go ahead and get our foundation going here. Now, I can tell you that laser physics is phenomenally complicated. Hmm. Phenomenally complicated, depending on the depth that you want to go to. And when you attend the seminars on laser therapy that are uh, technical seminars, right now the state of laser uh, conversation is only about the physics and about the molecular research aspect of it. Unfortunately, there are very few uh, people who are looking at it from a clinical point of view. So there'll be like three, well, I just returned from the uh, seminar in Hawaii on laser photobiomodulation, and there's just a, two, this is a, an American seminar, there were two chiropractors, American chiropractors there, everybody else, were res they were all research scientists. So what I decided is I had to try to figure out a way to break all this stuff down. And so I'm going to do my best with it, okay? And what most people don't realize is that actually in the beginning, um, Albert Einstein uh, gave us oops, the concept that led us to laser therapy. So I put here, in the beginning, and his quote was, a splendid light has dawned on me. I thought that was very appropriate. It was over 100 years ago, Einstein won the Nobel Prize for the first major paper. What do you think it was? Oh, well, one thing the Nobel Prize was um, his theory on um, electromagnetism in relation to light. Mm -hmm. And so he offered that in his spare time as an as a examiner, as a bureaucrat in the Swiss patent office. Okay. He developed the concept of light amplification of stimulated emissions radiation. His postulation of uh, photon stimulated emissions created the groundwork for the invention of the laser. He was the one who looked at things from a different perspective. He described how light could appear to behave as both a wave and a stream of particles, and that became the foundation for quantum physics. Waves and particles, that's what laser light is, okay? It is electromagnetism as a photon. Now we know about electromagnetism where you put on TENS unit on and stuff like that, right? But with light, we're talking about photon units. And they have very interesting properties and is what takes us that extra distance. By the way, do you know about Einstein's brain? You know what happened with Einstein's brain? It got stored in a box under a table and a, a professor from Princeton, at, they, they took, took it out of his brain. He had permission to keep it, but he literally kept it in a box. And very few people had access to studying it because, of course, everybody wanted to know why he was so smart. They had, a, finally, they tracked it down and they had several teams of doctors look at it and say, well, it weighs the same as everybody else's. That's not what made him a genius. <laughs> well, it's this and that. That's not what made him a genius. Finally, somebody looked at it and realized he didn't have the, the fissure, the sylvan fissure. So he had a way of communicating in his brain between the different lobes that was much more rapid. And in fact, because of the absence of the sylvan fissure, he didn't speak until he was like five. And he had a lot of difficulties kind of verbally with that. But that was, his, that was a source of his genius. Uh, what happened first was not the laser. What happened first was the microwave oven, okay? The Maser, in 1954, a $30,000 government grant led to the development of the Maser. And that's an astronomical amount of money back in the 50s, okay? And uh, they soon dubbed it Means of Acquiring Support for Expensive Research, right? <laughs> acronym. It was a failure. It was supposed to help World War II and with uh, radar detection. That's what, where that uh, information came out of. 
was a failure in, in terms of radar, but eventually it led to the development of microwave oven, and more importantly, it led to the development of the laser itself. Now, I'm from Buffalo, New York, if you haven't noticed the accent, okay? And I can tell you that Bell Aeronautic Laboratory was the coolest thing happening in my childhood. It influenced my entire community, the entire city was impacted, not just economically. It brought us to a whole level of thinking. And so one of the first things that happened um, is when they hired Arthur Shallow to experiment with light, he brought his brother-in-law in and they theorized. They, they had the, the, the room with Bell Aeronautics to theorize how to make a laser. Unfortunately for those guys, they didn't make the first one, okay? The first one was developed by Dr. Maiman at the Hughes Aeronautical Laboratories and they, he created the Ruby laser. But they didn't know what the heck to do with it. So initially it was called an invention looking for a job. They really didn't have a clue. What, what, what's this for? They came up with holography and they thought that was cool. You know? <laughs> okay. Now we have holography on our credit cards. Um, back then when they first developed it, Bell Aeronautics set up a, a room this size with the laser because that's how big they were. They, gave, they donated a ruby laser to the Buffalo Historical Society and they demonstrated holography and the whole community turned out. It was the coolest thing. The holograms were cool, but the fact that it was made with a ruby was even cooler. So that really got everybody's attention. So very on, I was influenced by all this information about lasers, 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 okay? Now, laser photobiomodulation in terms of its history, uh, the earliest clinical experiments, and this is um, as per um, Dr. Uh, Hoday, um, this is a wonderful text on laser therapy um, by Lars Hoday, is Swedish. The Swedish Medical Society is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal as a resource of information and uh, very helpful, and later on, uh, Lars is giving permission, we're gonna see a presentation by, uh, that he put together on uh, do dosage. But this is his most recent text, it's becoming the current Bible for laser therapy, because it's packed with technical information, research information, and pros and cons and discussions, and by the way, he slams Arconia in this, so mm -hmm. before you ever take a look at it, um, I believe he's referencing earlier models of the Arconia. And um, for you, for you all who don't know what an Arconia is, it's one of the first lasers, and God bless them, it's one of the first lasers that ever went through the FDA to be able to use in a clinical setting here. So, um, the earliest clinical experiments were carried out in 1963, and he has the reference, it's printed in Swedish, it's a newspaper article in Swedish in his, in his book here that he translates for us, uh, by American physicians in Boston but we don't know who they were. I mean, that information's been long. Um, they used a concentrated laser beam of high energy to kill cancer tumors in laboratory animals. 50% of the cancerous cells that had been implanted were completely destroyed by the laser, and in two weeks, the tumors were gone, and he was treating hamsters with this. That, that's phenomenal. That's absolutely phenomenal, but it inspired the next person, and this is Dr. Henri Meister, and in 1966, we'll see a photograph of him a little bit later. Uh, he was Hungarian, and um, God bless the Hungarians. Uh, he was a Hungarian physician who introduced me to laser therapy, and it's because she knew Dr. Meister. Okay? Um, in 1966, a Hungarian, Dr. Meister, working at the Semmel Weiss Hospital in Budapest, published the first scientific report. So that's, what, that's why we get him as the historic person here, because we can uh, date that. Um, and it's a non-thermal laser. You've got to tell your patients this. They're going to want to know, oh, is that going to burn me? Because the only thing they hear about laser therapy is the surgical stuff, okay? Low-level laser therapy is what we're doing. It's also referred to as cold laser therapy, okay? So it's non-thermal in nature. That means the, the laser is not hot. But I'm going to explain that there is a thermal response in the body. We'll get to that. Now he used, again, a, a, the ruby laser, the Heaney lasers back then, um, were also uh, becoming into invention, and he stimulated the skin of a rat, and it was a, it really not a very remarkable study. Uh, what he was looking for is to see if he could induce cancer, 
Okay? So the next question is, is laser therapy safe? So his question was, can I make this be cancerous? Instead, he healed where he had shaved these mices, and there's pictures in here if you'd like to see them, and they regrew re the hair real fast compared to the other one. So he said, oh, what else can we do? And he really began intense research in the field. Unfortunately, Hungary was an Eastern Bloc country. Remember the Iron Curtain? That information did not get out to the West for a long time. I lived in Buffalo, which is a community of, it's multi-ethnic, and it's a community of refugees at that time. And so I was able to get different uh, levels and different types of information. Uh, so when I met Marika van Vitsai, who was a Hungarian naturopath, um, and I knew that she had crawled from under those, uh, those, those horrible fences and what she had gone through to get to the United States. And she sat down and said, I want to talk to you about something. I knew that this woman was going to give me some information because she had gone through a lot to get into this country and she was a woman of courage. And in fact, she was a woman of courage uh, and it, it showed in what she was doing clinically. Because you know, in the early years, to be doing laser therapy without FDA approval, that's something that, you know, was kind of dicey, you know. We really didn't have a way to know what we were doing or anything like that. And she was doing it. She knew from, from her Hungarian counterparts what it could do. <clears throat> she was in one of my first craniosacral classes. She took me aside and she said, Dr. Keppel, I want to have a drink. We have to talk. You know, with that beautiful Zsa Zsa Gabor accent. And uh, over something not very alcoholic at all, we sat and talked for hours, and she shared with me that she was curing basal cell carcinoma with laser therapy. And I'd never heard of, and I'd heard of laser, but I'd never heard of using it clinically. And, and, and so from that conversation, a few weeks later, my dog had developed perianal fistulas, which is terminal at that time. This is back in the early 80s. And I called her up and I said, Marika, do you think that laser could help my dog? Uh, she said, oh, yes, darling, just come, bring your dog. So she put me up with a very sick dog, and we did a series of laser treatments that brought that dog so, uh, healed that dog so rapidly that I was just amazed. And I thought, you know, I can't not work with this. And I began exploring the laser for myself. I treated my dog, began healing my dog, I extended the life of that dog by five years using laser therapy. And at that time, I only had access to... Um, LEDs and helium, uh, a helium neon laser, which is a one milliwatt laser, and they were tremendous. But I took those parameters, what I had to work with, and I developed as many ways of working with laser therapy as I could put together. So you're going to get 20 years of it, okay? Um, okay, this has a potential to address many public health issues in a way that's non invasive, it's inexpensive. And I'll show you how to make it inexpensive. And it's effective. Okay? Look at this. Oops. Now think about this in the terms of the parameters of what the other part, of, our counterpart of uh, healthcare professionals are doing. Mistakes such as irradiating the wrong limb, using the wrong dose, frequency, or wavelength do not lead to morbidity, will not disable the patient. They may lessen the positive effects and therefore the speed of recovery, but you're not going to harm anyone. And if you want to know what's going on in terms of risk management, we have a specialist, but she didn't talk about her background in risk management. Tasha was a risk management person with Emory. And I want you to know she's got some stories for you, okay? So when we talk about risk management with laser therapy, there's only one thing that you want to be concerned about, and that's exposure to the eyes, direct exposure to the eyes. And we'll talk about that at length as we get more into doing the treatments, okay? Now... In 1960, we had the development of the first commercial lasers, and that was, as I mentioned, the helium neon laser. They're low power, 0.05 to um, 2 milliwatts. Now, that's 0 0.05. Um, you all have a handheld laser diode in front of you that we'll be working with, which is a, a 5 milliwatt laser, give or take, okay? So, a, a huge difference in the potential that you can do just with that little laser diode. The Heenies, I had a Heeney 
it was plugged in, and I had to really figure out how I was going to reach body parts because my plug it was, was in the heavy way. too. Oh, your stuff. arm got tired yeah, before was, the therapy. Was yeah, started. it was it was awkward to use. It was very large, and because helium neon was made, it's a tube laser, and I was running through an airport trying to catch a plane on my way to a seminar, and the thing broke. And it was <coughs> devastating. So there I was without uh, helium neon laser. Uh, the gallium arsenide lasers were produced in the 80s, and the GAIA's lasers, that's a 500 to 1,000 milliwatt. We won't be working at that power ever in this class. Uh, there's different parameters for that, and they were introduced in, this, in the 90s. I think, is that what they do for surgery? They use that, they use all kinds of different lasers for, uh, uh, on a surgical level. If you want to, you can spend a week and become a laser safety officer um, and get trained for that. We have a person out on Hawaii who's going to be teaching with us who is the lazy laser safety officer for the Hilo uh, hospital out there. Um, so that's another realm and that trains you to work with the surgical uh, instruments and safety issues with surgical instruments, okay? You know, today lasers, are, they're, they're everywhere. They're used in telecommunications, and yeah, I remember with the tubes. Um, currently, it, we've got the semiconductors, and we're just doing all kinds of things in telecommunications with it. I had uh, laser eye surgery, did the Lasix eye surgery thing. I've got a garage door opener that works on a laser beam, and it's wonderful because if you step in front of it, um, you know, your kid's not going to get crushed when you push the button way over here and you can't catch them because the laser breaks the connection and stops that door from coming down on you. So um, lasers are being used in, of course, the CD players and your speed trap guns. I don't know if you've been caught by them. Uh, and I, I, my, the people, uh, I live in Madison. It's a very small town. There's two places where you can get your groceries. And they all think I'm quite crazy because I think nothing of telling these young men and young ladies at the checkout, honey, if you get a paper cut, put your hand in front of that thing and just let it scan you because it'll take the pain away and it'll heal you. And they look at me. <laughs> so um, now the EPA measures uh, environmental toxins from a cloud of smoke using laser technology. And uh, Dr. Jeff Jordan, who's a PhD from the University of Buffalo, um, he's now at Nassau Langley Research Center. And he's developed a method for reducing smokestack emissions by 95%. Have you seen the recent articles about how bad uh, the, the ozone layer and the uh, polar ice cap is getting? Horrible. Absolutely horrible. So um, hopefully the technology that he has uh, created will uh, slow this down and, and possibly say, literally save the earth. Uh, Dr. Jeff Jordan happens to be my nephew. Uh -huh. So we have access to a lot of wonderful information through Jeff, and uh, he's just a brilliant. Uh, they have he just won the highest um, uh, prize for scientific achievement um, that you can as a young scientist. The only next thing for him to win would be the Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. um, and he was. They pulled him off the Mars project to to do this research, so he might wind up back you know, doing things with Mars again where he was supposed to invent, uh, they, were, they were looking for a way to invent uh, water, but that's classified information, so anybody in this room, no, I'm going to have to kill you, 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 you. Can't leave without information. Okay. Look, lasers happen, naturally. People, people don't realize that. Lasers happen naturally. This was an incredible phenomenon when they first discovered it. And guess who did that research? The Russians. The Russians, ever since Meister did it, began his initial study, <coughs> the Russians have been all over laser therapy. In Russia, they currently have, and I have uh, the most recent research from Russia, thank God I just got it the other week. And but in Russia, they have whole clinics devoted to nothing but laser therapy. That's how advanced they are, and that's how all over this they are. Why? Because they don't have the money for the pharmaceuticals. Yeah. They have to find a way that's inexpensive, that's, that you can repeat, that doesn't use up resources, and you can get to the masses. And boy, when they saw what laser therapy could do, they have done some of the most wonderful research and some of the most innovative clinical 
uh, things. Um, and we'll be looking at some of the Russian techniques. Um, and I'll tell you how I figured out how to spin it for this country. Because some of the things, because of our license, we were limited to. But Penny, I've got something else for you to do for your uh, for working with that diabetes. We'll talk about that. Um, now, so lasers are found in the natural state. You know, they happen out in the, in the galaxy. Um, when the cell dies, ap apoptosis, if, if you're not familiar with that, you'll hear me refer to that. Uh, when you see cell death, there's a pulsing in it. Have you ever heard about when people pass, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a phenomenon of uh, the way a person before and after, just before they die and after they pass, uh, there's, um, there's like an ounce of weight that's changed. And it's not food or anything. So I'm trying to figure out what is that. So is that the 21 grams? Is it 21 grams? grams? There you go. Yeah. yeah. Oxygen molecules release laser energy on a cellular level. Oxygen, there's laser involved with oxygen. There's laser involved with that pathway, okay? In fact, the cells that use laser energy for intracellular communication. Holy cow. Intracellular communication. We're going to be a therapist doing intracellular communication here using lasers. Oh my god, where do you see what we can do with that? The sun's rays, it causes seed to sprout for DNA and RNA changes. Okay, light impacts DNA and RNA. All right, they're full spectrum. The sun's full spectrum. It goes from wavelengths of 440 to 800 nanometers. And only one wavelength causes the seed to germinate. Now, we've got questions over here trying to understand the physics of lasers. Wavelength is a key to understanding that. If you want to figure out what laser, how to use it, and when, you've got to understand what a wavelength is, OK? It's an acronym for light amplification stimulating emissions. And it's a, they're amplifiers of light, OK? But more important, they amplify and create a single wavelength. And it's a coherent, tightly packed beam. <coughs> the single wavelength makes it pure. So it'll be in the light spectrum. It'll be red or it'll be blue. The coherence is what gives you the oomph. It makes a huge difference in laser therapy. The fact that lasers are coherent is the difference between lasers and LEDs. LED light is like shining a red light on a patient, okay? Same difference. You're just taking a regular red light. You can, and I've used this. I have an autistic patient that I've had her mother just putting a red light bulb in her room now, okay? They used a uh, red light, uh, red dyed uh, cloth over windows to recuperate Abraham Lincoln from smallpox. His son died which was a source of, of Lincoln's um, chronic uh, depression. But they were back, back then, they were looking at and trying to figure out, and by the way, Lincoln's personal physician was not American, he was a German. So you see, all this stuff is you know, coming together, the impact of European uh, science. So a flute, you know, is a sound resonator, and it can shatter glass because it can remake and make a pure tone. And with a laser, you get, a, you get a, a compartment that bounces beams back and forth. That's what amplifies the beam. And when they shoot it back out, what you get is a pure single wavelength, and you, and you get a coherent wavelength, which means it's concentrated. Look what I can do. OK, fabulous cat toy. I can't do that with a flashlight. So I can't illuminate the room, but I can take and tightly pack that bundle of light. That is an intense bundle of light incredible amount of energy. And I can feed that energy to the body and watch what happens when you feed that kind of concentrated photon energy to the body. It's absolutely nothing short of miraculous. I'm going to play with this, OK? So now we have our laser light pen. This is not L uh, uh, FDA approved to use on the body, OK? However, what I do with my patients is I point to the place that they have an owie, and I use it as a pointer on their body. And I say, look, see, it hurts there, doesn't it? We're going to take that pain away. That's how you can explain it if you wind up using this, OK? It's not FDA approved to use physically on the body. Now, here's the problem. We'll talk about refraction in a minute. 
Here, here's, here's the problem with the FDA and what's happened in our country, um, is the FDA is very careful about what we do and what we don't do with, you know, drugs and everything. Lasers, the development of lasers in this country has been limited because of the FDA. Erconia was the first one to get the FDA to say, oh, okay, yes, you can use it for, and they got it through after about $250,000 worth of investment um, to be able to use for specific things. So now what you see is different brands of lasers will be used for specific things. So for example, we're going to have lasers that are cleared by the FDA for veterinary medicine. We've got lasers that are cleared for use only on the carpal tunnel uh, syndromes, only on the wrist. And so you're limited. When you get something that comes to you from a manufacturer, they're going to say, this is FDA approved for this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, yes, and it's great for that, but guess what? Don't treat yourself. But guess what? You can use it for so many other things, and so we'll show you that. I had a long discussion with the manufacturer, and I said, okay, what's going on with the FDA? <coughs> Suppose I'm a clinician, and I take this, and it's cleared for this use, but I use it for something else. What's going to happen to me? Are they going to come in and steal my laser and shut down and take my records and all this stuff? No, the FDA is not interested in that. At this point, they, they, they're, well, they're well beyond that stuff, so they're not going to give you a hard time if you use the laser in a more creative way. Um, however, some of the lasers, because there are very few lasers that are on the market now, okay, and some of the lasers that are coming in are still under investigational uh, use. That means they're trying to broaden ways for it to be used. So our clinic is going to be working with a particular laser, and what we're going to do is a, a stroke study. And we're going to try to broaden the parameters so now people can say, oh, okay, you can use it in paralysis. Okay? And that's the kind of stuff that I hope you will all be joining us in doing. I hope that you'll take this, that you'll join us, go to an institutional review board, get yourself registered, and get involved with some of this laser research so we can unlock this incredibly wonderful tool and, and get it so that doctors can use it for all the different parameters that I'm going to show you you can use it for, okay? Um, so wavelengths travel slower in different media. So now what we have to find out is, okay, I'm shining this on the body, it's going to hit the skin, then it's going to hit the interstitial tissue. If I'm shining on a place that's got fluid, now it's going to hit water, then it's going to hit a muscle, then it's going to hit a bone. Right? What laser do I use? What are you trying to treat? Let's take a look at light refraction and talk about that. Different wavelengths travel at different speeds in the same media. <coughs> There's different depths of penetration depending on the wavelength. Wavelengths are measured in nanometers. This is going to be, and you can read it, this will be like a 630 nanometer laser here. Okay, it's red. It's in, the, it's in that spectrum of white. It's red. The infrared, it's, that's down here. That's considered low. And infrared is 830 nanometers, and you're not going to see it at all. You're not, it's not even visible anymore at that rate. Okay? Well, what's the difference? When light passes from one medium to another, it's changing speed, it's deflection, it's causing refraction. Laser light is coherent. When it refracts, it causes speckling. Grab your lasers. Got a laser? Got it? Want to borrow one? Watch, watch this. Take, uh, turn to somebody next to you and grab their fingernail and do it on yourself. If you don't have somebody next to you, take your laser and shine it on a fingernail. And I want you to tell me what you see. Once you've seen, once you've shined it on a fingernail, shine it on another type of tissue. I don't care where on the hand you do it. Is that working? I'll switch with you. <laughs> see what it's doing? Do you see the speckles if you get off the fingernail? And then interesting, now do it on the rest of the skin. Move it over. Okay? This is a demonstration of refraction. You will not get that with a non-coherent LED. That is very specific to lasers. And what's happening there is it's hitting something that's refractive. It's refractive. M muscles are refractive. Blood is absorbent, absorptive, absorbing, <laughs> whatever that word would be, okay? So, uh, measuring things. No. 
Okay, so laser light, it's coherent, it's coherent, it's coherent. And it refracts, it's got the speckling. That's what makes it, and it's a powerful bundle of energy. Just absolutely fabulous bundle of energy. Here it is, wavelength and frequency. Light is a disturbance of electric and magnetic fields. Okay, they travel in the form of a wave. That's what light is. That's what a photon is. It's electromagnetic. It's electromagnetic. It's magnet. It's electric. It has those impacts on the body. That's real significant, guys. And I'm going to tell you that it's significant to the extent that y'all have to pay attention when you're the therapist doing certain things so that you don't get too much electromagnetic uh, exposure yourself. I'm not talking about your eyes. Okay? Have you ever used those little trigger point thingies that you click? Oh, they're horrible. Oh, Remember what I'm talking about? They, they clicked. Oh, it was the first, you know, a hand tool. The sparker. Huh? Yeah. Sparker. Oh, the sparker. Oh, I hated them. They weren't grounded. They weren't grounded, so why not grounding yourself? <laughs> Okay. I had a, I worked a, with a wonderful kinesiologist, Dr. Uh, Samuels. I worked in her office when I uh, first got in practice, and she came to me one day. She was using those things. She loved that thing. She said, oh, my God, my heart. Well, you, you have to help me. My heart, I, I'm having heart arrhythmias. It's tachycardia. And she was in distress. I was like, okay, do we take you to the hospital, or what do we do? Well, I did some things to resolve it, but what I then realized was like, Carol, you're, you're grounding yourself here. Because if you touch the patient, you do the zapper, you're going to ground yourself. Remember, lasers are electromagnetic, so if you're doing a lot of laser work and you're touching the patient, and I will be teaching you to, to monitor the patient, but it, you got to be careful that you don't get too much exposure. Nobody's going to be telling you that stuff. That came from 20 years of working like that, okay? The wavelength of any wave is the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave. I'll draw you a picture on that if you need a picture. And the frequency is the number of times a wave appears per second at one place, okay? Again, the infrared is about 830 nanometers. They're, they're locking on to that. Remember, there's a certain wavelength that makes seeds sprout, right? And I look so hard. If anybody can find what that wavelength is, I want to know what it is, but I'll bet you it's in the red spectrum. But the infrared at 830, it's a short wavelength, and it's real high energy. So the higher, the bigger the number of nanometers, the higher the energy you're going to get, the shorter the wavelength you're going to get. What that means is you've got a laser that's going to penetrate the body farther. Whoop! It's going to go deeper. Okay? It's going to go right through that epidural layer. Problem is, is that when you get that high, sometimes what you might do is inhibit some things that are happening. So lasers can inhibit as well as stimulate. So if you get an 830 nanometer laser and you decide you want to do wound healing with that, you probably get okay results for the bottom layers, but you won't see this fast, as fast of results for the top layers. In fact, you might inhibit the healing of that. So you got to think when you're thinking wound healings. We'll discuss that. All right. Now a 630 nanometer is visible. But it's not penetrating. It's going to be superficial. What the heck? How am I going to fix a liver? How, how am I going to get past these big, deep muscles to make a change? Applied anatomy. Applied anatomy. You're going to start thinking differently about anatomy when it comes to laser use. Once you start thinking differently about your anatomy, you can take one of these 630 nanometer red lasers, little laser light pen, and you can turn on cranial nerves and fix paralyzed tongues. You can heal TMJ without grinding in there on that pterygoid, making people come to tears. And you can move an anterior atlas that fast and balance the entire autonomic nervous system. It is the coolest. And we're going to demonstrate all that stuff here and how to do it, okay? So anatomy, anatomy, anatomy is going to be a real issue. And you can be as creative as you want. 
with a laser of any wavelength. Okay? <coughs> now we use x-rays as chiropractors and they're a good example of a high frequency wavelength. We know that x-rays can be used also to destroy tissue. Lasers are used in that way too uh, in terms of surgery. Okay? Uh, one of the things at this, uh, this uh, conference in, in Hawaii that was so cool is uh, they had one of the research scientists there talking about an instrument, a new surgical instrument that they're coming out with. And it's the coolest. Because not only are they doing the laser surgery on the cancer and getting rid of the cancer tumor by burning it out and everything, but then they, so they're, bio, they're getting, you know, getting the biopsy, they're sucking it out, getting the biopsy. They're doing laser spectrometry, which means that they can go to the margins where the cancer is, and they can tell immediately in that surgery where the cancer has stopped and whether or not they got it all. Immediately. And that's, that's going to be coming out. It'll probably take another decade, but that's going to be coming out. And that's, those are the types of principles that uh, my nephew used when he was working with lasers and, uh, to figure out smokestack emissions and how to deal with that. It's that type of, of uh, information. Now, radio wavelengths. Everybody got their cell phones? Who's wearing them? Oh, good. <laughs> good. I didn't want to have to, you know, bring you guys up and out of it, but I want you to know that when I first got a, ra uh, uh, I did not want a cell phone. I fought getting a cell phone. Um, and when I did go to the store finally to get a cell phone, I said to the kid that was there, and he was in his 20s, really nice kid, and, I, and he'd been working in that store for a number of years. And I said, look, I do not want uh, one of these things where everything's packed in it and i got to hold it up to my ear because radio uh, frequency, when you hold it up to your head and you do that repeatedly, it's inducing tumors, brain tumors. The kid looked at me. I mean, he, he, got, he got pale. And he turned to me. He looked at me and he said, really? I said, well, yeah, what's the matter? He turned around and he showed me this brand new fresh scar where he had just gotten brain surgery. And what did he do for a living but hold up and demonstrate radio frequencies all day long on his head? Okay? Pay attention to your cell phones. Tell your patients to pay attention to their cell phones. Don't wear a cell phone over the heart. And I, I want to do a little test maybe later on and see what the heart rate variability instrument that we have uh, might show between a, a, a cell phone being turned on. Okay? So radio wavelengths are an example, again, of the same type of stuff. Okay, now think about what I just said. Why? There's a clinical setting. You've got to make choices. Why is a red light, red laser, at 630 nanometers used to treat acute conditions? And can you read the infrared statement? But an infrared laser is used to treat chronic conditions. Any ideas? Used to treat acute versus used to treat chronic. Okay, so think about this as we're working. In general, red lasers are used for acute. In general. Here's your wavelengths and looking at it in relation to color. Okay, just in terms of color. Okay, look at what you're wearing for color. Because look, you can influence your body with what you wear. Remember I said the sunlight coming through? Uh, Dr. Kogel um, down in Texas, a medical doctor who's uh, very innovative, he has his patients wearing different colored glasses as he does a treatment. I, I can bring in a set and you can play with them. Actually, he'll be at my office tomorrow, and so you'll, you'll see these glasses and you can experiment with the glasses. Okay, so if you choose, and look what I've got on today here, as much as possible, every color that I could find for the light spectrum, okay? just to keep your energy up and keep you going, all right? So orange is a low level. Red is lower than orange. Green, we've now got green lasers. We've got blue lasers. I'll, we have a blue laser here. Is, is that LED? That's LED though, isn't it, David? Yeah. Yeah, we, we've got a blue LED here. And violet, and that takes you into the infrared where whoop, you're, off the, you're off the spectrum. You can't see it anymore. Now you do have this... Uh, I think you have this graph in your book, in your, in your notes. Now. Well, the, your last statement isn't true. I'm sorry, what Infrared starts about 700 
and then goes to the 900 oh, and above. I, you know what? Actually, thank you. Actually, there will be infrared radiation um, emitted from anything where there's heat involved. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Anything, and that means your toaster will be emitted at infrared light. Uh, Dr. Regal, who is a uh, just Joseph Josefa Regal, who is a medical doctor in um, Spain, in Barcelona, Spain, is doing tremendous things in uh, laser research. She is a clinician, okay? And there's a difference between the pure scientists and the clinicians, and there's a huge gap between us because we don't speak the same technical language. And these guys over here are saying, this is cool physics and this is cool research on a cellular level, but it's not getting translated into the clinical practice. Dr. Josefa has bridged that. She is a medical doctor, a practitioner. She no longer writes prescriptions, hasn't written prescriptions in years. All that she does is laser therapy. She started the first uh, department of laser medicine in a medical school. And uh, in her community, and so now they're taking clinical questions and saying, "Okay, we're seeing this. Now let's go back to the lab and research it." So she's finding out tremendous things and helping us profoundly with that. However, she she also shared with me that a little even, even when you have this, there'll be a little bit of infra infrared coming from it. So um, there's always just a little bit in that spectrum. So it might depend on how your uh, your uh, Red lasers are, are, are tuned or what the source is as to how much infrared, but you get a little infrared. It's not the same as having a pure infrared laser, okay? Uh, these are the kinds of things you can do with laser therapy. And this is just a small list of them, okay? Angiogenesis, okay? You're gonna make, make, make all kinds of new vessels. It's impacting the stem cells, and you're seeing all kinds of information on stem cell research. And it's terribly, terribly controversial. Um, it's just bringing ethics right to the forefront of medicine. Well, guess what? We can bypass that by taking stem cell research to the next level with laser therapy and just stimulating what's in the body to differentiate into new tissues with the laser. It improves microcirculation. That's a main factor with laser therapy. You're going to get microcirculation happening. Lowers the insulin levels, and, and, and we have Penny to talk about some of that. Promotes wound healing. <clears throat> I'm going to digress and talk about wound healing, okay? I had a, I seem to digress a lot. I hope that's okay. Um, I had a patient uh, who came to me very informally. I was at home and I decided to go for a walk with my German Shepherd, again, my famous German Shepherd, who was still alive and up and kicking and walking, and thanks to laser medicine. And I had uh, a neighbor, I saw him, he was like, he didn't have his shirt on. And that's not so remarkable in the South, you know, when it's hot. But he, he was having a hard time, and he was really pathetically knocking on another neighbor's door, and I, and I said, what's going on with you? He said, oh, I'm in so much trouble, I can't put my shirt on, and i got to try to go to work today. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I can't raise my arms. I said, well, well what happened? Well, he said, I want a contest. I want a bicycle. I want a 10-speed bicycle. And I went to pick it up, and when I brought it home, he didn't put it in the car. He decided he was going to ride his bike. Well, he'd never been on a 10-speed bike. He didn't know how to apply the brakes. And we lived in a very hilly part of Atlanta. Piedmont Road wasn't far from us. He got on top of a hill. He was heading into major traffic. Didn't have a way to stop this bike. So he dumped it. And in the process of that, he took all the stem, the top layer of skin, off of his back. This guy was just like this. I mean, literally. And, he, and th this was about the fourth day. And there was nothing that the doctors could do medically for him. And, and, but he was like, I've got to try to work. i got to have some money. So I said, wait, come back, come back to the house. I, I think I can help you. And I took my little laser. And at that time, this is, I, no, I had a Heaney. I used a Heaney laser on him. And, uh, and it's only one milliwatt. That's not a lot. That's not strong, OK? And I, I shined it just back and forth. And, and in, a, in a little bit, I'll, I'll show you patterns that you can use. Um, and it didn't take, but maybe you know, it's this weak laser, okay? It, it, so it took longer. But it, it took maybe a full eight minutes. But in that process, I watched that stuff scab. I watched it scab over. 
I watched a scab form in front of my eyes. I was like, this is so cool. You can watch the granulation happen in the wound. It gets glossy. That's the first stage of healing. That's the granulation. And then it, and then it starts to pull together. And then it starts to close. He left my office moving his arms and wearing a shirt. Didn't take, didn't take even 10 minutes. Most of the time was spent talking. That fast. And, and that was so now we have little kids come in with the boo-boos where you can't even put a band-aid on it. Say, so, okay, sit down, I'm gonna fix it, and then you'll be able to touch it and move it. And you take that pain away, and oh, they just think you're a miracle worker. This is gonna replace bandages. There's so many creative ways of working with this. Okay, so we know that it's gonna work with wound healing. We'll talk some more about that. It lessens pain and edema. Tremendous for, for edema. Tremendous for helping with pain and promotes collagen formation and it reduces scarring. It stimulates axonal and peripheral nerve growth. This is a chiropractic tool. This is a chiropractic tool. It will replace the activator. There's nothing, there's nothing that the activator can do to stimulate peripheral nerve growth and axonal, uh, stimulate the axonal uh, circulation that happens as quickly as what you can do with a laser because the laser happens right now. It's going to replace, you won't need, I haven't used my activator in I don't know how long, especially since I got a hold of some of the things that David brought to me. You're going to see it's so cool. Collagen, tell me about those SI joints that stay chronic. What is that about? Yeah, hello, here we have Catherine raising that chronic sacro sacroiliac joints. Remember they're held together there by all those wonderful ligaments? Man, if we can strengthen and make the body go ahead and lay down collagen, wow, they're going to start holding that. Plus, it takes away the pain. It takes away the edema in those joints. You're going to have people up and walking in no time. You need to lay for bed. You can sleep off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It works from within the cell. Okay. And it resolves conditions that even manual therapy and ultrasound can't touch. Okay, it's one of the safest forms of electrotherapy. There's all kinds of research out there. The problem is getting that research translated into English because the Russian research is almost, it, 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 it's almost unavailable. Um, and and it, we have to get it translated then into how to apply it clinically. Um, there's no adverse effects. Sometimes what you'll have is a patient will be a little bit more sore immediately. And I'll show you how to deal with that. There are ways that you want to think about applying the, your laser so that you don't uh, <laughs> ex exacerbate that. And several hours of it, uh, they'll be sore for a little while. You, I haven't seen anyone stay sore for 24 to 48 hours at all. I, I, that's not happened in my practice um, because of the way that I do the laser therapy. But they do, and I have, stayed sore for maybe 20 minutes or so. And then, boom, everything went away. Not just the soreness from the application, but the original condition. Here's the problem with ultrasound, okay? It is one of the most commonly used uh, forms of electrotherapy, okay? But it's limited, and you can't do it over bony prominences, pins, plates, acute injuries. Um, laser therapy, you don't have that restrictions. You'll be seeing, you'll be meeting Jason. Jason has um, a shunt in his brain, okay, for the cerebral spinal fluid and different, different areas of patients with pins and things like that. I've treated patients with plates in their heads. No problems using laser therapy in that circumstance. Okay, here you go. Here's all the different ways to think about it.